You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, I'm Mike McDaniel, the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. Welcome to A Bible Answer. This program is dedicated to answering your questions from the Word of God. We have three gospel preachers with us to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. I'm Bill Branstetter. I preach for the Church of Christ in Marion, Illinois. I'm Gerald Cowan. I preach for two small churches in southern Illinois, one in DuCoin and one in Susser. My name's Glenn Head. I preach for the Sunny Slope Church of Christ in Paducah. We're grateful to have these brethren with us today to answer your questions. This program is overseen by the elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee, and around 35 faithful congregations of the Churches of Christ in a four-state area. Thanks for watching today. Our first question goes to Bill Brandstetter. The person says, in view of Hebrews 10.25, can a baptized believer of the New Testament justify the absence of the assembling with the saints? Many Sunday morning worshipers will attend preaching but will willingly miss Bible study, Sunday evening service, whether it be preaching or a song service, and hit and miss a Wednesday night Bible class. Each service benefits the Christian in many ways and is an encouragement to each one. How can we as faithful Christians teach the young Christians as well as the older Christians that attending all services is invaluable? Brother Brandstatter. Thank you very much for this uh, very good question. Of course, we have all asked that question perhaps many, many times. Let me look at this question in two areas. First of all, the conditions, and number two, the context of Hebrews 10, verse 25. Surely there are some conditions in which people would miss services. Many of us know of individuals who, because of medical reasons, cannot attend Sunday morning worship or Sunday night worship or Wednesday Bible class. Certainly, I've known of individuals over the years that could not drive on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights, and so basically I told them, hey, if you can't drive, don't come because we don't want you endangering your life. And so many times uh, people will miss for various reasons that we know nothing about, only God knows. But let's look at the context of Hebrews chapter 10 and ask ourselves, what does this passage say in its context, and how can we apply it today? And in looking at the context, hopefully answer the last part of that question about how do we encourage younger individuals. First of all, the book of Hebrews was written to individuals that had come out of Judaism and obeyed the law of Christ and become Christians. Many of them were very tempted to apostatize and go back into Christianity. We see little evidences of that throughout the book. For example, in Hebrews 2 verse 1, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. In chapter 3 he says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And so we see this evidence that some of them were thinking about departing and leaving and going back into Judaism. And of course in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And so we have this problem in Hebrews, in, in, that is the background and the context. So in Hebrews chapter 10, when we get there, the Hebrews writer begins talking about the law of Moses, being a, or the old law being a shadow of things to come. And then as we approach verse 22, through 25, and 25 is the verse we usually, we usually use regarding the forsaking of our assembling ourselves together. In verse 22 he says, Let us draw near with true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Then in verse 23, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Again, talking to those Christians in the first century who were tempted to apostatize and go back into Judaism. And then verse 24, and I want to consider 24 and 25 in particular because this will help in answering also I think the last part of this question. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. The word provoke there might be better understood to motivate. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting or urging one another. 
and so much more as you see the day approaching. If you'll notice in those two verses, in verse 24 and 25, there seems to be more of an emphasis placed on the faithful Christian and his responsibility. And once in verse 25, we read about those forsaking the assembling of themselves together. We ought to want to be together. Christianity is a one another religion. We need each other. We need to encourage one another and exhort one another. And perhaps one of the ways we can help to stop the practice of some, that some people have of making a habit of absenting themselves from the assembly is to be more encouraging, to urge people more, to love people more, to provoke them to good works. And as we look at this text, we see that he says, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Quite often, rather than just noticing people are absenting themselves from worship or from Bible class, our emphasis ought to be, what can I do to encourage that person? How can I get that person to come back? What am I doing to help the situation? And so certainly we see here a major emphasis placed on encouraging one another. Now, let me just put this, go back to conditions in the, conduct, in the, in the context one more time. The manner of some is, no doubt, also applies to some of those Christians in the first century who had come out of Judaism, been converted to Christianity, and they were making it a habit of missing the assembly. This has the idea of someone who habitually does it, not just an occasional thing. So let's be more fervent and more dedicated in being exhorters, ones that encourage, ones that motivate each other and help each other. And when someone misses the assembly, we should contact them, see what we can do, and help to provoke them unto love and good works. Thank you very much for this good question. Thank you. Now to Brother Cowan, we have this question. If flesh and blood cannot enter heaven, then how can there be a physical resurrection? 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Brother Cowan. Well, it's an interesting question, and one that gets asked quite frequently. I think the easiest way to answer it is to point out that there is a misunderstanding about whether there is, for us, an actual physical resurrection. The idea of a physical resurrection is based upon two things. First of all, that uh, Jesus was raised from the dead in the same body in which He died. It was necessary for this to be the case. They had to identify Him as the very same person, not another person, not an imposter, not some counterfeit or stand-in, but the very same Jesus who died is the one who was raised. So the body is there. Even the wounds and the scars from His wounds, many of them are still obvious, still present in Him. We are not told in Scripture that we will have a physical body in the resurrection. If you read carefully uh, the rest of 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Paul talks about there being a difference in the kind of body that is buried and the body that is to be resurrected. And actually the body is not resurrected. God gives the resurrected person a new body, which Paul says is a spirit body, not physical, not flesh and blood. So he, he makes this, this comment in verse 50, I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Now, he has said earlier in the chapter, there, there are different kinds of bodies, different kinds of flesh even. We understand that there is a physical or natural body which is perishable, corruptible, mortal. It will die. It will cease to exist. And there is also, he says, a spirit body, a spiritual body, which is imperishable, incorruptible. It will last forever. God will give that body to us in the resurrection, a new body, the spirit body, not like the old one at all. So people need to stop worrying about whether they're going to have the same, in, in, in my case, for example, the same broken down, uh, physically imperfect, uh, problematic body. Am I going to be eternally in that? Well, I certainly hope not. And the fact is, it won't be the same. So thank God for that. But we have a body coming from God which will accommodate our person, the person. We need to make a distinction between the person and the body. The person is not the body, and the body is not the person. The person is in the body. 
the person is in the body, but the body is not the person. And that's a very important consideration for us. Now, we have, in the case of Jesus, a continuity of identity. It was the same Jesus who lived in that body and preached in that body, who was with the people in that body. The same Jesus who died is raised. The same body, in this case, was raised, and Jesus was in that same body. But here's the point. The person is continuous. The person continues. So when he was very small, very young, he was Jesus. He was the person. And when he grew older, and even when he died, and when he was raised, he's still the same person, but his body is not the same. Same thing's going to be true with us. We're not the same in body throughout our life, but we are the same person throughout our life. And at death, our person does not change. We're still the same person. We will be in different circumstances, different relationships, and in a different body, a different kind of body. Paul says, and he makes the distinction for us, he helps us at least to make the distinction. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, he says, glorify God. Now you glorify God in your body, your body, your spirit. They belong to him. But you notice he separates you from your body. Your body is not you. The person is the same. The same person will be resurrected, but with a different body. And by the way, uh, even the wicked, we, we, we like to read this and think about having a glorified body like Jesus Christ. And, and that's the other point. I didn't, didn't complete the point. Uh, Paul says that Christ will come and he will change our vile body, our lowly estate, into the likeness of his glorified body. But we see body and we think some kind of physical, spatial thing. No, the person is the same in a new body. The relationships with, with uh, the person and with God, uh, all, all of that will change. But here, here again is the point. Everybody who is raised will have a new spirit body, an indestructible, imperishable, immortal, eternal body, and will be in that body for eternity, either in heaven or hell. The righteous will be glorified, and the unrighteous will not, but both will have an eternal spirit body. They will be in that, exist in that forever. The person does not change, no matter what happens to the body. I find the question very interesting, and there's a lot more that we need to say about it, but thank you for the question this time. We've reached the halfway point of our program today, and we want to offer to you a free track. Our track today is entitled, Does It Make Any Difference Which Church I Attend? If you'd like to have this tract or if you'd like to receive our eight-lesson Bible Correspondence Course in your home uh, to improve your knowledge of the Word of God, just contact us. You may write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You may email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net or you may call our toll-free number. 1-800-436-0463. If you call the number, please leave your full address and a good clear voice so that we may meet your request. You can also contact us by means of our contact page. You're seeing there our address on the website, www.abibleanswertv.org. We also have a YouTube page. There's a link to it from the website that you can go to that. But if you're on YouTube, on your phone or on your tablet, you can just search a Bible Answer TV and you'll find our YouTube page where you can watch past programs of a Bible Answer. Now back to our questions and our first question to Brother Head is the idea of the rapture found in the Bible. Brother Head. Hello. The idea of the rapture is not in the Bible pretty much because it promotes the rapture, the tribulation, the thousand year reign of Christ here on this earth. It promotes the physical battle of Armageddon, which is not mentioned in the Bible. As far as those four things, five things going along with each other, the idea of rapture is not in the Bible. You know, when you look at the dictionary and you open up and you look at the word rapture, 
the first thing that comes up in the dictionary, that idea is in the Bible, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. But what promotes the false idea of the rapture? Well, media sensation, so many books being written. There are so many things in an earthly sense, in a materialistic sense, that promote the idea of the rapture. I know the movie, the series Left Behind, this was an article that I was reading, and I just cut bits and pieces out, but it says, Left Behind series. Left Behind is being brought to the big screen again. This time it will feature Academy Award winner Nicolas Cage in a bigger budget, an intense fictional plot framed by the theory that Jesus will snatch believers and the innocent children away to heaven just before the world plunges into its darkest hour. You know, so many movies, we could recognize that with many movies we watch today. And there's bumper stickers that say, in case of the rapture, this vehicle will be unmanned. And you know, we kind of chuckle at that. The rapture, the only way to fly. And it keeps going. There was a question, are our pets going with us in the rapture? There are people that truly believe that. One of them said, I totally believe our pets will be raptured right along with us. And then there's ads on the internet. You can check yourself that you can volunteer to be a post-rapture pet caregiver. Where are those things in the Bible? Where are those things? Now, the word rapture, it does not appear in the Bible. You know, Wikipedia mentions the rapture is when Jesus Christ returns to remove the church, all believers in Christ from the earth. The rapture is described in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, 1 Corinthians 15, 15 through 54. And like I mentioned before, the rapture will trigger some things. But you know what's mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 is being specifically spoken to Christians. So in this section of verses, which I'm about to read, why would Paul be writing to non-believers and telling them what would be happening? They have no concern about their future. They have no concern about their eternal future. But those at the church at Thessalonica, Thessalonica had a concern. And so therefore, Paul, this being written to the Christians, but I would not have you to be ignorant, starting in verse 13, brethren, I, will, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. You know, many say that these verses that speak of the trump of God and the, arch the voice of the archangel, the, they say these are the noisiest verses in the Bible. And for good reason. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This has nothing to do with non-believers. Paul is specifically addressing brothers and sisters in Christ because they have a concern. They are concerned about what will happen in the second coming. And then the same as in 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 54. Paul is writing to Christians. And he starts off, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. He's addressing a concern of theirs. But then how does he end? You know, the, this, the rapture, where is salvation considered in it? So many are worried about the hype, about who will be left, who will stay, about airplanes being in the air with no pilots, on and on and on. But where is salvation mentioned? But now here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it talks about death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the victory. There's where our concern is. Not being transported up. It doesn't make sense with the Bible. But now that's Paul writing to Thessalonica and writing to the church at Corinth. But now Jesus, see what Jesus says to all. Jesus is telling everybody in John 5, 28 through 29. He's speaking of the coming of one resurrection, two judgments. 
He says, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming. You know, so many times in the New Testament, the hour, the day, the day, that day is mentioned, in which all that are in the graves shall hear His voice. You know, by those that talk about the rapture, they talk about those that are in Christ hearing the voice. But Christ says, all will hear His voice and shall come forth. All shall hear His voice. All shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So he's speaking to the good and to the bad, to the righteous and to the unrighteous, not just to the righteous. Matthew 16, 27 says, For the Son of Man shall come into the glory of His Father with His angels. So many times that phrase is used. The one coming, the second coming, not coming over and over and over again. And then shall He reward every man according to His works. Every man, that means the righteous man will be judged by his works and the unrighteous man will be judged by his works. At one time, at one resurrection, at one judgment day. The rapture is a fallacy of men who are unlearned, they're unstable, who rest and twist and pervert the scriptures of God for their own benefit and also to their own destruction. And you know, one more verse before we go. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. When Christ comes, where will those that are left behind be? Where will they stay? But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. They shall be gone. Time has ended. The earth is ended. There is no second chance. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? What person ought you to be? Looking for and hasting into the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now I mentioned the word rapture a little while ago when you look at it in the dictionary, the first thing that you come to. It's a feeling of intense pleasure or joy. Notice what Luke chapter 15 says about it, verse 7. Joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. Rapture. Luke 15, verse 10. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Notice where the joy is. Notice where the rapture is, that feeling of joy. In 1 Peter 1, 8 through 9. Whom having not seen ye love, and whom though you... Now you see him not yet believing. Ye rejoice. You jump for joy. With joy unspeakable and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith. Even the salvation of your souls. Thank you for this question. Thank you. And now to Brother Brandstatter. What does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? Brother Brandstatter. Thank you so much for this very good question. This is a common term we hear throughout the religious world of our day. And it's also a term that's used in the Bible frequently. Let me tell you, first of all, what it does not mean. It does not mean that we simply pray to God for salvation. Nor does it mean we go to a mourner's bench and pray and get some kind of special experience. But let's go to the Bible and look at a couple of passages. There are two passages primarily, Acts 2.21 and Romans 10.13. They both say, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So let's let the Bible describe for us what exactly that means. And I want to look at an occasion of the Apostle Paul who called on the name of the Lord. And in Acts chapter 9, if you'll notice in Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26, we have the conversion accounts of the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 9, we read that he came near to Damascus, and a light shined round about them from heaven. And he heard this voice, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And of course, the, the voice was Jesus. Verse 6, of chapter 9, he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And he said, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Well, then Ananias appeared on the scene, and to him the Lord said, Ananias, I am here, he said, Lord. The Lord said, Arise, go into the street which is called Straight, inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying, or he prayeth. Notice, Saul was praying, and he was going to be told what he must do. And so if, if we turn to Acts chapter 22, which is also an account of the conversion of the Apostle Paul, who then was Saul of Tarsus, 
we read something similar going on. And in Acts chapter 22, verse 10, What shall I do, Lord? The Lord said, Arise, go to Damascus, and there shall be told thee all things which are appointed for thee to do. And so in Acts chapter 2, verse, or 22, verse 13, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour, Paul says, I looked upon him. And in verse 16, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized, wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Notice, if you will, that he was praying. And I asked, went and told him what he was supposed to do. And he was told to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Asking the Lord what he must do to be saved. Submitting to the Lord's will. Being saved in the Lord's appointed way. In Romans chapter 10, verse 13 is the other passage. And it says there in verse 13 that a person must call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. But as we look through that passage, we also find in verse 16 it says this, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. And then in verse 17, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So obviously calling on the name of the Lord does not mean simply praying. It doesn't mean you go to a mourner's bench. Jesus said that not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 7, verse 21. So calling on the name of the Lord means submitting ourselves to the Lord's will in His appointed way and not in the way that we want to do it. It doesn't mean to simply pray, but it means to obey God in the way that God has ordained, and that's obeying the gospel of Christ, believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, repenting of our sins, confessing His name, and being baptized to have your sins forgiven. Thank you very much for that good question. Thank you. I want to apologize to Brother Head. My phone went off while he was speaking, but he kept right on, right on doing what he needed to do, and that was great. I was checking our YouTube channel because I knew that there was a program. It was number 391. It was made four years ago. In that program, I was checking to see how many views it has. It has nearly a 1,000 views. And on that program was Brother Garland Elkins. Brother Garland Elkins passed away recently. His funeral was held on October the 31st, and uh, I was privileged to serve as an honorary pallbearer for his funeral, along with other faculty members of the Memphis School of Preaching. Brother Elkins was 90 years old, a teacher for the School of Preaching, lecturer, writer, great man, member of our family. We'll miss him. Thanks so much, and see you next week. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you would like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.